is the Chris Abraham Show. Hey there, this is Chris Abraham. This is the Chris Abraham Show. Uh, my name's Chris Abraham. And this is episode... Let's see. It is episode... Come on. I shouldn't be bothered because I cut out all the blank parts, so it doesn't really matter. Come on, you piece of bollocks. All right, this is season seven, episode two. Sorry about the huge delay. It's just been so cold. I haven't felt like I've wanted to do any like walkabouting kind of uh podcasting i also haven't been going to the gym or anything else like i've just been schlepping to the cafes to the uh to the uh library and then home today i'm going to try to go to the gym inshallah uh today i wanted to talk about ukraine and uh i even want to talk about palestine so by using a story right because we know that um, even though the world didn't know, there's uh, been a huge, what is it called, powder keg or pressure cooker going on between Ukraine and, uh, and Russia for the last 40 years. And it's been based on this, which is to say, you are a buffer state, you have agency, you are sovereign, you are democratic, you have everything, you are free to make every decision except not being a buffer state. Now, at some point, people can get really confident that with the support of NATO or whatever, or they can think that war can be gentlemanly, or they can assume that um, the hegemony of the West can easily overpower a drunken and decrepit and underpopulated Russia. But let me illustrate this with a story from my life. So I grew up in Hawaii, and I was kind of a chubby white kid. And in Hawaii, uh, we're called Howleys. And in Hawaii, uh, one of the favorite pastimes is this thing called Kill Howley Day. So, like, there's this belief that it's pretty easy to beat up, like, Howleys. Especially Howleys who do not have, like, cousins and uncles and so forth, right? So there's just me, an only child. Uh, and I uh, joined this school, seventh grade. And this eighth or ninth grade kid calls me out to uh this uh kid calls me out to fight by the art annex by the dumpster and uh i show up because like i'm stupid but i'm brave and he just saw this seventh grade howley kid and probably all of his friends were like dude you gotta show that freaking howley like who's boss or whatever who knows what the narrative is i'm just using tropes but he didn't know that my dad was a marine and from the moment we moved to Hawaii, my dad's been te teaching me how to fight dirty, like how to throw um, punches with my elbows, how to take out joints, how to use the full weight of my body to knock people over. Um, just really brutal shit that you shouldn't be teaching an eight-year-old. He taught me how to fall, how to tuck and roll. He taught me how to punch, set my thumb is outside of my, my fist. Um, and I had a lot of rage because before seventh grade, my mom and dad separated, right? So there's a lot of rage. And I'm also six foot three. So I'm also a big boy. And I was even a bigger, fatter boy, taller than all of my uh, fellow students, even at uh, seventh grade, which is like, what, 12 or 13? I don't know. Um, so, um, so this kid squares up with me. Now, I've been in Hawaii since I was six, and this is like me at 12 or 13, and I know there's going to be a fight because I know I'm not going to puss out because I'm crazy and I'm rage-filled and my dad is a Marine and I have had freaking like squared up with a lot of local boys growing up. So uh, there was only one that I ran from, which is when I was in elementary school and he was intermediate school and he chased me around. It was terrifying. I hid in... Uh, in the janitor locker and all kinds of stuff. It was humiliating. But in general, I, um, I square up. Uh, and uh, I was not a known entity. I was just recently there. He didn't know me. I looked like a, a tall, lanky, chubby nerd. I was seventh grade after all, 12 or 13. So all the kids heard about it and they all showed up at the 
dumpsters slash art annex. And I know from my vast experience of fighting uh, local boys, mokes and titas, well, mokes, fighting mokes in Hawaii, that everybody, for whatever reason, takes off their shirt before they fight, right? So I'm standing there and he starts doing that fighting dance, which happens way before the fight starts. And everybody's saying, you can do it, go, 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 you can do it, you can do it. And I'm just standing there. I'm scared shit, right? For me, it's an existential crisis. For me, as an only child to two parents who work, um, and squaring up against people who have lots of cousins and brothers and uncles and, and nieces and nephews and parents and grandparents, I could be killed. I don't have any backup. And from my first couple of weeks, for first couple of months at St. Louis School, all my friends were D and D nerds. So they were all in. Uh, they were all in what you would call it. Uh, they were all in um, band, right? So, so anyway, this is a short episode because I'm almost done. So they square up to me, and the moment I see the guy, I forget his name. The moment I see the eighth, ninth, tenth grade or whatever, the moment he starts taking off his shirt and he's got his hands over his head, I go in, I push him over, I go in, I push him over, and then I kick him until he, until I'm pulled off of him. But I won that fight. I won that fight brutally in nanoseconds. Didn't even need to give an elbow, uh, uh, elbow hit. I saw that he was committing to fight by fighting by taking off his shirt, and I destroyed him publicly in front of all of his friends as a seventh grader. And I never fought in Hawaii ever again. Nobody ever, 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 ever even tried to start a fight with me because I had existential dread. And every time I fought in Hawaii, I thought it was uh, a decision between life and death. And so I, I street fought. I didn't box or spar or to me, it wasn't even a, um, a, a pecking order kind of thing. I needed to destroy my enemy immediately and so bombastically that they would never consider fucking with me again. Mind you, I don't think anybody wanted to be my friend from then on. I, I think the fact that I didn't have a lot of cool local friends in Hawaii growing up in high school is because that's pretty antisocial behavior. I kept my nerdy friends because they know that nobody would pick on them. Um, and... I've heard people say things about me because I ran for student government and I became student body president senior year, which makes me sound more popular than I was. But, um, and I heard one guy say, oh yeah, Creasy's pretty cool, brah, but he's freaking crazy, you know, it's crazy. And I think that all had to do with the fact that I obliterated complete war crimes, complete war crimes, complete ethnic cleansing, complete, uh, 100x more force than was necessary, but as a result, I never had to fight again. So that is episode two of season seven. Mahalo and aloha. All right, this is a continuation of the uh, season seven, episode two, uh, because I don't think I made enough contacts. In the previous section, I said that um, when I lived in Hawaii, I felt alone, I felt targeted. I felt like an alien. I felt like I didn't have support of a big family as an only child and a latchkey child and a child who moved away uh, 6,000 miles from where I was from, which is New York City, New Jersey. It's last New Jersey, not New York City, New Jersey, dummies. Um, and it was a pre-internet world where long distance phone calls were the kind of things that families saved up for. And they made sure that they were extreme. And this is the 70s and 80s where everybody was poor, unless you were rich. And being rich was notable, not normal. So I felt very alone and, uh, and, and abandoned and a little uh, exposed. So most of the time I would hide behind a, a big smile and I would hide behind uh, a, a goofiness and a, an extreme affability. But if remotely cornered, I would, res I would respond with extreme brutality in proportionate to what was going on because I felt everything that in any way interrupted my flow was an existential crisis that could result in, in death. This continued to college, this continued through my 20s. Uh, 
like I said, I've always been above like 180 and always been above six feet. So, and a dad. And, and also, Jero TC and Karate and all that other stuff by the time. Anyway, so my analogy, of course, is both with regards to Israel and Russia, right? So I understand that Palestine is its own ethnic state. But to, to an outsider, there are 8 to 11 other Arab states immediately there, right? So why? Why? I know that... None of those states, including Egypt, want Palestinians. I don't know what that's about, but um, all things equal, they're self-identified Arab Muslims. So you would think that there's plenty of other countries to live in that are also Arab Muslim, or at least Muslim. Um, whereas Israel is a very small country in a very small state and a homogenous people and god this background noise is crazy luckily i've got uh noise canceling headset on and the magic of the adobe noise reducer but of course i'm yelling at you so this feeling even if america and the uk and all of western europe and all of uh, the diaspora countries are pro israel even though Israel looks like the bully because they're superior, richer, stronger, better armored, better provisioned in that they're fighting against relatively primitive fighters in terms of this idea of fighting uh, $5 million rockets against $5,000 rockets. That's not the frame of mind. The frame of mind, it was me, right? Even though I was six foot three and 200 pounds in school, maybe six feet tall and 180 pounds, 190 pounds. As the seventh grader, I was the vulnerable party. I was surrounded by locals, local people who have families, relationships, cousins, uncles who've lived there for a very long time, who considers Hawaii their aina, their land, their home. And I, in many ways, am this little lily white kid from New Jersey who is here reluctantly and never appreciated Hawaii at all and thought everybody around me was extremely violent and brutal and whose priorities were not nearly as a feat as mine. I considered myself a New York City boy who would go with my mom to visit museums and see musicals. And these are folks who like football. It's like that anywhere. So I felt an existential threat and Israel feels an existential threat. And any time you poke at Israel, you are gonna get um, elbows, you're gonna, the moment you look like you're taking off your shirt, you're gonna get knocked down and kicked to fuck. And that should be something that people realize. Um, same thing with Russia. I don't think anybody, especially Newland and John McCain or anybody else like that, knew how existential the cultural life of Russia is especially after getting a, the biggest L ever in terms of losing the Soviet Union and uh, being very, I guess, pandery, very especially diplomat in terms of saying, well, you can have anything and everybody can have freedom and sovereignty. All we want is a buffer state and that's it. And not even that having any respect because the moment you seem like you're weak, people don't think it's very fair that you are in fact brutal, like me. I'm a smiley guy, but I'm fully capable of killing somebody to protect myself or others. I mean, literally kill them um, with jail time and all that stuff. So uh, so if you're like, that's a big guy, bet you he could be dangerous. And then I spend my entire relationship with you trying to act like a big uh, poofy doofy loofy doofy coo cutie pie poofy poofy pie. It's because that's, that's one of my tactics and strategy about living, right? Nobody wants to come close to you if you scare them. But if there's any threat at all, I'm going to over-respond with extreme prejudice. And that is simply the existential threat that Russia and the state of Israel feel, whether or not we think it's rational for them to feel that, whether or not we think it's fair, whether or not we feel like that um, extremely out-of-proportion reprisal is war crimes or not. Um, America doesn't have a concept of proportionality. 
if you look at our gun law and our self-defense law and every single law that we have, um, your job is to not not hurt someone else. The moment you hurt someone else, they can kill you. I mean, pretty much that's the law of the land in D.C. I mean, in the United States. Um, I realized that my buddy told me that in Italy, um, all the self-defense laws are completely based on proportionality and that you can only respond with as much um, with as much counterforce as you are, as is used upon you. But in America, if you just like break into my house and open my door without being invited, I legally in at least 30 states can shoot you in the head dead. And because of the way gun laws are, um, killing you is the better legal solution than, than wounding you or winging you or shooting you in the leg, just based on the way uh, self-defense laws are built in America. So Americans should really understand what's going on with the state of Israel and the state of Russia, because um, not only are they historically extremely brutal, I mean, everything that we love about Mossad in terms of how they uh, hunted down all former Nazis and either killed them or jailed them um, is exactly how they in, uh, handle any foe, not just the Nazis, any foe. And as I said in an episode so many episodes ago, maybe, I said that uh, there's a conversion rate in the state of Israel, which is to say, I heard that when Israel, previous to October 7th, would trade um, prisoners or trade hostages or trade kidnappers, kid, kidnap victims, would trade the kidnapped, mostly as prisoners. Every time that uh, Israel would trade prisoners with Palestine, uh, Palestine would trade a thousand Palestinians for one Israeli. So that's the exchange rate of what the state of Israel considers in terms of the worth of a human. So one Israeli is worth a thousand pa uh, Palestinians. So if 1,200 people were killed uh, from, uh, as a result of October 7th, let's say, if uh, 1,200 Israelis were killed as a result of October 7th, then 1.2 million, based on the translate, based on the conversion rate, 1.2 million uh, pa uh, Palestinians or ha Hamasians or 1.2 million Hamas are going to die as a direct result of that. So, um, so anyway, that is the the result of people not realizing that there is a uh, that there is a whether it's real or mental illness or just fear based um, or just um, multi generational. Uh, pain or just memories of Holo Holodomor and of uh, the Holocaust and so forth, um, it's impossible for the state of Israel to behave against anybody, giving it a bloody eye, bloody nose, uh, a black eye. There's no way that they're not going to go ahead and take down a city block or an entire tract of land. Um, so it's inevitable. And there was no other outcome possible. And Protesting for uh, Palestine's never going to work, um, but it's an amazing, if you will, it's an amazing um, uh, lever. It's an amazing tool to dismantle the master's house. That is not the master's tools, because uh, no matter what the truth is, the uh, the direct result of this worldwide unrest with regards to supporting uh, the right to live, the right to exist of the Palestine people is about workers, and it's about communism, and it's about uh, anti-imperialism, and it's about decolonization, and it's about uh, communism, and it's about um, anti-capitalism, and all that fun stuff. Anyway, lots of love you guys, and I'll talk to you soon. Looking forward to seeing you. Season 7, Episode 3. Mahalo. Thank you for listening to The Chris Abraham Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. 
Until next time.